Okay, so now we're in section 2.3, and this is the first time that we're going to be computing limits with real sort of mathematical rules and laws, as opposed to just plugging in values and seeing what happens. So first of all, most functions we deal with are built up out of smaller, simpler functions. And one way of getting a more complex function is to combine simpler functions via arithmetic. So this is how limits behave under arithmetic. Um, so we're going to let f and g be two functions such that their limits at c exist. We see that the limit of f plus g is the limit of f plus the limit of g. That's rule one. Rule two is that the limit of f minus g is equal to the limit of f minus the limit of g. Rule number three says that if k is a constant, then the limit of k times f is k times the limit of f. Rule number four is that the limit of f times g is the limit of f times the limit of g. And the fifth rule, you might guess, is that the limit of f divided by g is the limit of f divided by the limit of g. But this is only guaranteed to hold so long as the limit as, uh, of g is not equal to zero. We can state these more succinctly by saying that the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. The limit of the difference is the difference of the limits. The limit of a constant multiple is the constant multiple of the limit. The limit of a product is the product of the limits. And the limit of a quotient is the quotient of, a, of the limits, again, so long as the denominator does not go to zero. Now let's apply these laws. Suppose that f of x goes to 3 as x goes to 1, and g of x goes to 4 as x goes to 1. Now let's evaluate first the limit of 2 times f of x plus 3 times g of x. Well, the first thing we're going to do is say this is a sum of two functions. I'm going to break it apart using rule number one, so the limit of 2 times f plus the limit of 3 times g. Now I've got constant multiples of f and g, so I'm going to pull the constants out in front using rule number three. So I get 2 times the limit of f plus 3 times the limit of g. Finally, I plug in the given information that f goes to 3 and g goes to 4 as we approach 1. It gives me 2 times 3 plus 3 times 4, which is 18 using arithmetic. Okay. B. Let's evaluate the limit as x goes to 1 of f times g minus f divided by g. The first thing we see is that this is a difference of two functions, so I will use rule number two to break it up into two limits. The first one is a product, so rule number four allows me to break that up into a product of limits. The second is a limit of quotients, and rule number five allows me to break that up into a quotient of limits so long as the bottom does not go to zero, but it doesn't, it goes to four. Great. So I have the limit of f times the limit of g minus the limit of f over the limit of g. Then I plug in my given information to get 3 times 4 minus 3 fourths, which is, after you do the math, 45 fourths, or 11.25. Okay, so those first limit laws are great, but we need to be able to evaluate the limits of some basic functions first. So here are some rules that allow us to evaluate the limits of some basic functions. First of all, a constant function. The limit of a constant function is just that constant. If you look at the graph of a constant function, no matter where x goes, y is just staying put. The limit as x approaches c of x, the function y is equal to x, is c. It's not too crazy. Now, if I take a monomial, I take n, and uh, excuse me, I take x and I raise it to the power n, where n greater than 0 is a whole number. The limit as x approaches c of x to the n is c to the n. I can basically just plug in c. More generally, if I take the nth power of a function and I take the limit, I get the nth power of the limit. Rule number 10 tells me what I can do if I'm taking the nth root of x. It says that the limit of the nth root of x as x approaches c is the nth root of c. I can basically just plug in. More generally, if I take the nth root of a function and I take the limit as x approaches c, I get the nth root of the limit of f and note that just uh, f of x has to be greater than or equal to zero if n is even for this to make sense. This last set of rules allows us to compute the limits for polynomials, rational functions, and more generally, algebraic functions. So let's look at two examples. First of all, let's evaluate the limit as x approaches 2 of x minus 1 over x cubed plus 4. Rule number four says since we see a ratio, we can break it up into the limit of the ratios. The top is a difference, so rule number two says we can break that up into the difference of the limits. 
rule number one says that we can break the bottom up into the, diff, uh, the sum of limits. Finally, rule number seven says that the limit of x we can just plug in two. Rule number six says the limit of a constant is that constant, which is one. Rule number eight says that the limit of x cubed we can just plug in two and get two cubed, which is eight. And rule number uh, six again says that the limit of four is just four. We do the arithmetic and we get 112. Okay, part B, let's take the limit as x approaches negative two of the square root of x squared minus two x plus three. Rule number 11 says that I can take the square root and put it on the outside and evaluate the limit on the inside. Rules number, rule number two says I can break the difference up across the limits. Rule number three says I can pull out a constant multiple. And rule number one says that I can break up a sum into uh, over the limits. Finally, the rules that we just looked at, rule number eight says that the limit of x squared as x approaches negative two, I can just plug in negative two to get negative two squared. The limit of x as x approaches negative two is negative two by rule number seven. And rule number six again, again says that the limit of three is three. I do the arithmetic, I get the square root of 11. Since 11 is positive, this makes sense. The limit is the square root of 11. Question one, using the limit laws that we've just discussed, carefully, explicitly, evaluate the limit as x approaches zero of the cube root of one over x squared minus one. You might be wondering right now, well, how is this any different than just plugging in the values? Well, the answer to this is, insofar as all of these rules are concerned, it isn't. This is something called the direct substitution property. If we take f of x to be a polynomial, rational, or algebraic function, and if c is in the domain of f of x, then the limit as x approaches c of f of x is indeed f of c. But just for the time being, in the context of section 2.3, I would like us to use the limit laws carefully just because when we get to more difficult situations in the future where direct substitution does not apply, I want us to be careful when applying our limit.